minor editing, uh, you know. And if one of us pisses our pants, we should take a break. <laughs> well, I'm just say You know, I know you're concerned about me, but <laughs> I, 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 I'll be all right. I'll be all right. Ready, ready, Pauline? I'm ready. Cameras rolling. Both Cameras of them. Cameras rolling. And it's all good. Okay. It's all happening. All right. Well, everybody, it's a beautiful day here in Forest Knolls, California. My name is Guy Meyer, and I'm here with a visiting guest, Professor Emeret Emeritus Guy McPherson from uh, the University of Arizona, is it? Yes, that's right. And uh, Guy, you, your, your field was conservation biology. Yes. And you are, at this point, in the midst of a tour is it a learning tour, a speaking tour? What? This is a speaking tour for me. It's a five-week tour mm -hmm. that began on April 2nd. Mm -hmm. So I'll be back home in New York, mm -hmm. a little bit outside of the city, mm -hmm. on approximately May 5th, as I recall. Mm -hmm. And the basis, the, 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 the purpose of your tour is um, a, for you to share your work on the environment and your sense of where we're at in the environment? Is that the... Absolutely. Thing? Somewhere along the way, I mistakenly became the world's leading authority on the topic of abrupt climate change, hmm. leading to human extinction in the not very distant future. Hmm. So that's the point of the talk, is to hmm. alert people hmm. to what is happening and mm. what is likely to happen mm. in the near future. Mm. So, for example, mm. I point out ways that we, mm. our species, could lose habitat here mm. on Earth. Mm. Well, it, um, it sounds like it, it is a sort of a disturbing and frightening topic. Um, in your studies of this abrupt climate change, I guess a lot of it is based on um, models, maybe, or speculation of if this, this, and this happens, that something could happen. Do you? What What do you? What is your primary basis for the the, the in in your definition of, of of these forces that you see the abrupt climate change? What What are the What are the primary forces that are that humans are doing? That right. Say? So. As of about two years ago, yeah. humans on Earth were experiencing the highest global average temperature experienced by Homo sapiens mm -hmm. here on Earth. Mm -hmm. So our species mm -hmm. has never been on a hotter planet than mm -hmm. we're on right now. Mm -hmm. And every indication tells me and anybody who's really paying attention to the mm -hmm. climate science mm -hmm. literature, mm -hmm. every indication tells us that we're headed for a much warmer planet in the near future. Mm -hmm. Because the rate of change is so important, mm -hmm. and because we are experiencing abrupt, mm -hmm. or accelerated, or beyond linear, or exponential climate change, mm -hmm. we could run out of habitat for our favorite species pretty much any time. As a conservation biologist, that's primarily what I studied. The, the three pillars Mm. Underlying conservation biology mm. are speciation, mm. when and with what predecessors a species comes into existence, mm -hmm. extinction, mm. when and by what means the last individual of a species dies, and habitat. Mm. Habitat is the place or the environment where a plant or animal typically lives or grows. Mm. And we typically mm. live and grow mm. as Homo sapiens mm. in something not at all resembling the situation we're found in today with smartphones and electricity and water running through the taps mm -hmm. and grains being stored so that we can survive the so-called hard times. So this is very different in the history of Homo sapiens. We've never had this ability until quite recently mm -hmm. to grow, store, and distribute grains at scale. So what mm -hmm. that means is we haven't had the kind of climate that permits us to lock up the food. So, how did we used to live before we became addicted to clothes and smartphones and automobiles and, and the light coming on when we flipped a switch? Yeah. It was a lot different. We lived a lot more like the human animals we were mm -hmm. for 
300,000 years or so. It's only been within the last few thousand years that we have begun storing that food and allowing our species to go into population overshoot, mm -hmm. to overshoot the land base on which we're living. Mm -hmm. Do you think that um, <clears throat> when you see some of these projections, uh, now I'm starting to see projections of, of uh, the population collapse, which maybe you're speaking to it, 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 when you speak about extinction as well, but To me, um, what I wonder is, aren't we seeing sort of an evolution? Basically, it is an evolution. Obviously, it's an evolution going on on the planet. Um, there's exploration or movement of, let's say, simple lifestyles, but it, it seems so kind of, shall we say, kind of buried in the overall... <laughs> snowball effect of the greater civilization that it doesn't um, it certainly hasn't gained much traction since the times of the 1970s when I was uh, being a young student briefly in college and, and learning about many things that I think young people don't realize that we had access to knowledge even back in the 70s that were fairly accurate pre predictors of what we were going on was going to be happening right now Absolutely. The chief of the American Petroleum Institute, of all people, mm. Frank Eichard, said mm. at the 1965 mm. annual meeting of the American Petroleum Institute that we are running out of time. Mm. We are running out of time mm. with respect to climate change. Mm. That was 1965. I was five years old. Mm. I, you know, I mm. couldn't shoulder much blame for mm. the situation at mm. that point. And I would argue that most of us are in the same situation. We, we ought not shoulder a bunch of blame. For what has happened because we were born into this mm -hmm. you and i were born into this mm -hmm. set of living arrangements mm -hmm. what my friend tim bennett calls born into captivity mm -hmm. we were born into a jail cell mm -hmm. that we thought was freedom mm -hmm. civilization mm -hmm. and it really required us and still requires us to act in certain ways or we get shunned by the entire society 15 years ago i've been i began looking for a place to live off-grid mm -hmm. And I made that transition over the following few years. Mm -hmm. And so I lived off-grid, literally defecating in a bucket for a decade, thinking that people would follow, thinking that because I'm a person of considerable privilege and a professor and I was really good at what I did mm -hmm. in teaching and research, mm -hmm. I just assumed that a whole bunch of people would follow my lead mm -hmm. and would start living the more simple lifestyle. And I'm sure that... Mm -hmm that the authors of all those books in the 1960s and 1970s about living simply and reducing human populations, I, I thought that, you know, I suspect they were genuine as well. Mm. They expected people to just take that lead when mm. they showed us the way. Mm. And so few did. We, so few did and, and, and so many acted as if we are addicted to growth. Well, it's growth and otherwise. Yeah, it's interesting um, because that I think that's an interesting uh, experience that you and probably many uh, people who felt they had the message, who wanted to quote get back to the land or uh, create an alternative, what they hoped through their own life that they might try something, uh, may have come up against that themselves. Uh, that they felt, wow, this is. Yeah, and nobody's following my lead, but I, I guess the question, because I can, I can relate to that too, but, you know, the idea of defecating in a bucket doesn't sound that appealing. And, and so it, it's sort of, to me, and it's a constant spinning of my brain, and my brain would probably be a lot happier if it wasn't spinning and just would stabilize there, is... How do we, as a species, and you can see it, I mean, like I can still see the, the, the knowledge base that's, that's really a hand-me-down through generations and generations. It goes before there was even the young people of the 60s and whatever. I mean, it's just, there's always been those people who had a respect for nature, though, and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and perhaps even the wisdom 
to see when the non-respect for nature is going to, you know, sure. it is just causing a, a, a lack of integrity in the whole system. So what I'm still holding out for, but that's the, the point I think that you're dealing with, is this, this, this running out of time experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on the planet. And what does it entail... I mean, is there a point uh, in making adjustments to our lifestyle? And the other thing I would say is, can it, could it be an improvement of our lifestyle mm -hmm. to aid happiness to actually follow through with maybe some simple things? Doesn't it seem like, as you look back on your last, uh, the last decades going back to the 70s or 80s where you look for the leadership dare I say in like and I don't I don't mean to put anybody down for sure. being a non-leader but still having um, a, a voice that was looked upon as uh, you know right. someone who was quote carrying the torch or looking at if I look at the work of the Sierra Club or or uh, Greenpeace, or, uh, or who were those leaders? Uh, and I don't want to put any names, uh, in point names, and, and people, every, everybody does, you well, know, the if, best they can. If, for example, John F. Kennedy's voice was instrumental in getting us to the moon, mm. then maybe somebody in that position, mm -hmm. him, mm -hmm. or his, one of his predecessors, mm -hmm. or one of his mm -hmm. successors, yeah. could have used that same voice, that mm -hmm. same platform, right. to inspire people to live more locally, to inspire people to live more simply. Yeah. You know, the standard response to me moving off grid was betrayal. Betrayal from the friends and family who oh. I thought I knew. The secondary response was defamation, slander and libel primarily. Hmm. So it, trying to live differently, hmm. uh, even at the edges hmm. of what we call industrial civilization, right. much less a little bit beyond the edges, yeah. You're viewed as, as insane. There's something must be wrong with you. My colleagues were asking other colleagues. They no longer spoke to me after I left active service mm -hmm. at the university. But they were asking other mm -hmm. colleagues, what was wrong with me? Did I have a rare brain disease? Is that Because that's the only reason they could come up with. Mm -hmm. That somebody would leave a position of enormous privilege, mm -hmm. that of a tenured full professor, mm -hmm. voluntarily. Mm -hmm. you got to be crazy to do that. He must have some rare brain disease. So... You know, even trying to, to make minor changes mm -hmm. within this set of living arrangements, mm -hmm. to which we affectionately refer as civilization, generally attracts more animus than it does friendliness. So it's, it's difficult for us to shift outside the system, to mm -hmm. move to a, mm -hmm. to a slower lane. To well, I think it is difficult, and it's interesting because I see all the, um, I don't want to say all, but so many young people and myself, in, well, actually, I don't own a car. I see people who are so, you know, into the earth, but they still have the bumper sticker on the back of their car. You know, they've got all the vegetation on the dashboard, uh, but they're still involved in this daily experience of, to me, this very visceral, physical turning on the ignition, you know, turning on the fire. Uh, in order to have access to a style of life that many people say, well, it's impossible to do without. You can't do without. I think your, your notion of, of uh, the pressures of conformity, which mm -hmm. I see, of which you're, you're speaking to, is, is truly um, a force that uh, <laughs> it restricts people. But what I'm w wondering at with you, uh, whether you were do, doing such a, whether we need to do something so radical to affect change, or whether a smaller amounts of change, if done with more people, could actually affect a object. I was thinking, you know, the a, a, a bobsled metaphor. If the planet Earth or civilization is something, you know, flying down at a high rate of speed. Not that it doesn't mean you're going to end up 
Well, who knows where, if it's a crash or a soft landing. I'm not going to, but what I'm getting at, I guess, what I'm trying to get at, is just a little subtle movement makes the thing, you can turn the direction. Sure. Uh, you know, if we were on the Titanic, for example, yeah. and we made a one degree yeah. course change, right. a, a thousand miles right. before hitting the mm -hmm. iceberg, Right. That would make a tremendous difference. We'd mm. have never even seen, mm. nobody on the Titanic mm. would have even seen the mm -hmm. iceberg mm -hmm. because a one degree change early enough mm -hmm. makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. We're at the point now that a 180 degree change won't make a difference. We're at the point now, we're in the midst of abrupt, irreversible climate change. And what that means is we are on the, we are losing habitat for our species on the planet mm. right now mm. at an accelerating rate. Mm. And in the not too distant future, we will lose habitat for our entire species across the entire globe. It's too late. Some would argue that we've already hit the iceberg. Others would argue that it's 30 feet in front of us and we're still going full steam ahead. I don't think anybody who has studied the issue extensively can say that we have time enough to make that one degree change because we're a thousand miles out. I think when, I think there's a snowball rolling right now, and the other snowball that I personally thought would be when I was younger was just going to continue to roll along and emerge. That being a quote counter culture of people who are on whatever levels, dropping out and creating alternative culture, whatever, it didn't really set, it didn't really, it, it became kind of subsumed into the, the dominant culture. I, I feel like we still have to, to me anyways, um, um, give energy, give acknowledgement to anybody out there. And I think it's, I think it's everybody. And, you know, I mean, uh, they, they've done surveys of uh, Republicans, right? Have you, have you seen some of this stuff that, that more than 50% of Republicans do believe that climate change is man-made? It's sort of a, it, it just feels to me like we're, um, the, the thing that you said too about that climate change was, what did you say? Abrupt, not just irresistible. Abrupt and irreversible. Irreversible. Now that makes me wonder or makes me question because it's a, a, assumptions that it's irreversible, yet the ozone hole got restored to some degree. The, I'm just wondering if we were to slow down on a massive level and maybe nature will, will help provide us that impetus to do that, um, whether nature d does respond. Supposedly the ice pack this year was uh, the seventh uh, smallest. It wasn't, it wasn't now the next world record of the smallest ice pack uh, up in the North Pole. Is, are, is there room to believe or to hope that the, that the whole dare we say, uh, chaos of it all doesn't necessarily rule out things getting, you know, less, less carbon, uh, less, you know, I, I, it's, it seems like a huge thing to even ask or to believe or, or completely naive to think that, uh, you could get people to, um, to me, give up this notion of the, the bucket list. I feel personally that my generation, or actually my generation, I'm saying this as if I'm back in the 70s or 80s, because I'm almost thinking I'm my generation of young people. No, my generation of young people now with silver hair, I guess. But um, it, just, it just seems to me we still have that power to make a, a, a small change. And the small change, like a snowball, once really rolling, who knows? I mean, I just don't, I can't, I mean, do you have in your figures of this uh, irreversible climate change and extinction, did you have something kind of worked out on a scientific basis? That yes, you were, absolutely. Yeah? All of my work is supported by literature from the peer-reviewed 
journals, mm. the most conservative sources mm. in the history of our species. Mm. Consider, for example, something that my friend Bill, Bill Eddy calls the McPherson Paradox. If we keep civilization going, we know that civilization is a heat engine. Mm. A paper published on December 26th of last year mm -hmm. indicates that we're headed for a two to three degrees Celsius global average temperature rise by 2030. 2030. No humans survive that. As sad as I am to say it, no humans will survive that. Mm -hmm. That's using civilization as a heat engine based primarily on the work of Tim Garrett, atmospheric scientist at the University of Utah. And it doesn't really matter how we power civilization. Wind turbines, solar panels, wave power, it all is a heat engine. Okay, so let's instead of that, instead of keeping civilization going, let's say we turn off the switch. Let's say we even turn down civilization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a paper published in 2013 by Levy and colleagues mm -hmm. indicating that as little as a 35% reduction in industrial activity will cause the temperature to spike one degree Celsius within a matter of days or weeks because of something called the aerosol masking effect or global dimming. On February 8th of this year, mm. in the journal Science, mm. there was support for that paper indicating that we've massively underestimated global dimming or the aerosol masking effect. So we're in the situation of we can keep heating the planet mm. and heat it beyond our ability to inhabit it, or we can stop heating the planet, turn down, much less turn off, just turn down industrial civilization, and that causes the temperature to rise even faster. So doomed if you do, doomed if you don't. It's mm. an, the aerosol masking effect is something that almost nobody has heard about mm. because the corporate media mm. and the governments of the world mm. and the paid climate scientists of the world mm. are not telling anybody. Mm. They're running from it because they know what it means. Mm. It means you'll stop shopping. It means you'll start living more fully. It means you'll start living as if your time is short here on planet Earth, instead of buying, 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 and planning for the future that never comes. Well, I think, isn't, isn't that the case that people are buying, buying, buying because they do think their future is short? Isn't there a whole bucket list mentality that we must go run and do this and run and do this because, uh, you know, and that's kind of a, cynic, a cynical streak that is, goes back to my peer group when I was young too, there was always a, a cynical vision of, you know, whether the world's surrounded by nuclear weapons and, you know, good luck, you know, the, the, only the fools would be the ones to believe that there was a potential, even like going back to JFK or Martin Luther King, these mm -hmm. voices that actually believe that we could have a decent future, uh, that, that things like war was not absolutely a necessity that the racial intolerance and hatred is, is something that we're always going to have, particularly as long as we have, you know, there's just that. And we see what happens to all those people who promulgate the message of love. Yeah. They all get murdered, every single one of them. Mm. Two Kennedys and a King within a five-year period of time in the 1960s. Mm. And, and thousands, mm. at this point, thousands of people who were involved in the American Cultural Revolution in the 60s and 1970s, mm -hmm. all murdered, all removed from mm -hmm. service mm -hmm. because they were preaching love. Well, yes, and they were also, uh, they were also rebels. They, it was not just, quote, love. It was, it was an, a willingness to break with what is sort of this guiding paradigm that's, of, what, that's of, what love means. Breaking right. from the soul-destroying, mm -hmm. death-causing mm -hmm. set of living arrangements mm -hmm. that we call civilization. Mm -hmm. It's a murder machine. Mm -hmm. we're, we're driving to extinction some 200 species every single day. But we're destroying habitat for humans all over the planet. This is a death-destroying culture that we're part of, and we refuse to admit it. Well... <laughs> Here's the situation, obviously. We have the, the idea that we are I'm, I'm searching, you know. Uh, we all have, we make choices every day. Mm -hmm. We do make choices every day. And we make compromises every day. Everybody does. We, we brought the crystal geyser plastic bottles up here to, for refreshment. 
you know, where do I run to get this or that? Um, I, I think because we are alive today, because we are, despite, and it's probably a nice background sound to have the whatever that chipper is or something going on in the background. Chainsaws and the wood chipper. The, it just, the definition of our time. Yeah, it is here in this classic, beautiful country wilderness of California, which is sort of a, a constant, actually, where humanity is. And, and we live in nature, but of course, everybody has a fence between their yards to make it, you know, put the deer out or got the poor deer. Uh, I'm, I, I feel like that the ongoing drama and the story of life it, it, you could almost see a, like a destination to this point where humanity had to gather all this all those tools and all that wealth had to come together with more wealth and more tools and and more separation or abstraction from nature um, I don't think um, I don't know, of course, and, and you have all the tools of your scientific knowledge. It seems to me that uh, it, it, nature could be very fierce and unforgiving to us very soon, um, and, and likely will be. But I, 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 I think that there's an inner resilience both to nature and to humanity. Um, and I, I hope, you know, I was, I wanted to, and actually before I even started this show, in, in my grandiose visions, I was thinking I, I wanted to dedicate this show to three individuals because change comes from, uh, like sometimes you have to have a, uh, a person's attention, shall we say, if, uh, leadership, right? You've got to get somebody's attention to get somebody to listen to you. And look, look what we did in California with the drought years, somehow they... We saved, started saving almost 20 to 30 percent of water reduction was was done. It was sort of like, wow, that wasn't so hard, and it wasn't so hard. So why aren't we uh, a asking people to uh, maybe refrain one day a week from turning the key on the car? You know, why not have a return to a peaceful Sunday where we don't, where we experience our locality, experience our community. Look for it for strength. Look for it for to further help us tie us together through these uh, these challenging times. Actually, what I was getting at was the attention thing and the, the leadership. Was I wanted to bring um, Alexandra Octavia Cortez? That's her name. Am I saying it correctly? I, I have no idea. Yeah, she's been called AOC for so long. I didn't know she right. had a name anymore. Exactly. And the and the young woman from Norway, Greta. Thunberg, Thunberg. Thunberg, and bear with me, hold on to your hats, Donald Trump. I, I really wanted the three of them to be listening in. Now that may not be happening because it may be just too, you know, too much out there. But these are people who have the world's attention. And here we're talking about the Green New Deal. Uh, and it's fine, we need, something needs to be going but in a way, it's sort of like saying it's all externalized again. We're going to have this grand legislation. Something's going to come and save us or save you, but it's not about an alteration. And I would think it could be, again, to me, it seems like it could be a pleasant alteration to have more interaction with your local people, to have more... Quiet of time. course, yeah. Of course, right. I think we should stop focusing on the Green New Deal that not a single Democrat voted for, mm. because it's not going to happen. Much mm. as I would like to think it is, mm. because it would be at least a decent step in the right direction. But I think the Green New Deal is a reminder that what mattered to us during the American Cultural Revolution is what should matter to us today. Mm. And that's community. Mm. And that's creating relationships with people mm -hmm. and maintaining those relationships as communities. 
there is very little two guys yeah. can do right. about what happens in Washington, D.C., or what happens in Norway, yeah. or what sort of right. things are spewed by politicians mm -hmm. or youngsters. Right. We don't have any control over that. What do we have control over? We have control over me and you. Right. We have control over the, the house where we live, right. maybe, and the interactions we have with the people who live there. And then maybe by extension, we have the ability to improve or utterly destroy the feelings of the people we work with on a daily or weekly basis. Mm. So let's focus there. Let's focus mm. on our actual human communities, mm. not to mention the beauty of nature. Mm. You know, we're in the midst of the sixth mass extinction. We're driving to extinction 200 species every day. There's no turning the ship around at this point. We're in the middle of it, and each of the previous five mass extinction events has required millions of years for recovery of a green and thriving planet again. Mm. Let's live with urgency. Let's live as if our interactions matter. Live mm. as, as if our community, mm. our home, the mm. people we work with, as mm. if they actually matter mm. to our lives and in our lives. Right. So that's what we have some control over. Mm. Let's pursue that with the most enthusiastic of gusto. Let's not get all bogged down in the arguments that occur between the the so-called right and the so-called left, the twin cheeks of the corporate ass. That's just beyond our ability to have any control over. Mm -hmm. Guy, mm -hmm. this is about me and you. This conversation no, I think is you're about me and you and the people we meet every day. I think you're saying, I think you're ringing the bell very clearly right there, Guy. And I, I, I think that's, you know, I think you're expressing something in my own heart, finding better words for it. Um, and, I, and it is a challenge. It is a, 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 a big challenge. And that's partly why people back away from it, the whole thing of community, the whole thing of, of longevity and maintaining relationships and not shying away from uh, the, the experiences hard. that are like uh, set you back and make you want to like, oh, I, I got to move out of this place. You Be, know? Before we went on the air, you were talking about Compromise. Right. Every relationship is based on a series of compromises. Right. And so it's no surprise that we are reluctant mm -hmm. to enter into a relationship, no matter how intimate with somebody, mm -hmm. because we know there's sacrifices, we mm -hmm. know there's compromises right. that are going to have to be made. Right. So for the most part, you're right. We tend to be fairly cynical. Mm. We, we tend to curl up with the people we know mm -hmm. and, and therefore restrict our own horizons mm -hmm. and our own ability to learn mm -hmm. and experience. Mm -hmm life mm -hmm. through another lens right. so yes I think we're both we're, we are both asking for everybody to take a step mm -hmm. to take a stand mm -hmm. to to put the hand forward mm -hmm. to show love mm -hmm. for the other human beings in our life that we haven't shown that to yet so far because we've been reluctant to enter into that sort of relationship with somebody if we can start with you and me and with the people we live with mm -hmm. and expand that out mm -hmm. and expand that out. Mm -hmm. I don't think it will do a thing to slow mm -hmm. or stop the six mm -hmm. mass extinction mm -hmm. or abrupt mm -hmm. irreversible climate change. Mm -hmm. But what it will do mm -hmm. is improve your life and mine. That taking the chance, to putting my heart out there mm -hmm. so that somebody can stomp the crap out of it. Mm -hmm. That's taking a chance, that's mm -hmm. taking a risk mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. if we were all willing to take, mm -hmm. we were all willing to take that risk, our lives, I believe, would be improved. I think that's, I think that's excellent. I think that's exactly right. And I think that's, in a way, the whole scenario of, of impending doom backed up by, you know, dare I say, God's own science. That's a paradox. And, and that, what would they call that when you say something that makes something no longer true or whatever? We have to use a sense of giving up almost mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to fully or at least get the go. courage Let, uh, letting go and, of and I don't give up and mm -hmm. and maybe that's my problem uh, I mean, it, I'm not suggesting we give up yeah. I don't even know what give up means well, I anymore. meant it I meant it in a metaphor of uh, not uh, well but, actually but in I a think... way of, of it is a kind of a way of surrendering to, uh, you know, letting your... Surrendering to your circumstances? Yeah. I don't think that's such a bad thing. Mm. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Trying to save another species for another day? Mm -hmm. That's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of risk based mm -hmm. in love mm -hmm. that I'm talking about. 
that extends beyond the mm. human species. Mm-hmm. And we can we can do that every day with this human species. We can we can put our hearts out there mm. so that somebody can smash them if they want. Mm. But if we don't put them out there, we're not going to we're not going to be able to take those love based steps mm. towards creating positive interactions with people. Would you say? I'm, I'm sure. I think I know the answer to this. But to understand ecology or understand the environment, is it something about our consciousness that's um, you, you, you use the four-letter word love. Uh, is is this something about the, the fundamental of the ecology? Is, is it one and the same we're talking about? Of our the heart? And well, the, the, it's, it's trying to understand that things are unified. I I think the opposite is generally true. Okay. When I was studying ecology, and mm-hmm. I'm primarily a field biologist or a okay. field ecologist, when mm-hmm. I was studying ecology, I was focused on its definition, which is the study of, mm-hmm. so that's important, it's the study of, mm-hmm. the interactions between organisms. Mm-hmm. Okay, So I was so focused on the study of that love never entered my mind, mm-hmm. that interactions with other people and with the environment generally mm-hmm. didn't much enter my mind. Mm-hmm. That came earlier and paradoxically later. Mm-hmm. Earlier when I was growing up in a tiny drinking town with a logging problem in northern Idaho. And then later when I again realized that love is as important as whatever it is I'm trying to quantify mm-hmm. with my studies. Mm-hmm. In between there, I was the typical left-brained scientist focused on collecting the facts and not paying nearly enough attention to the interactions, to the interrelationships within my own personal life. I think I'm better now, but I need to check, check with a shrink about that. Uh, human therapy, earth therapy, you know, it's um, a metaphorical, uh, I think of the Wizard of Oz or Emerald City, where everybody gets repacked and gets awarded a a medal for whatever courage we might actually have uh, or brains that we might actually have and and well I think one thing we could do is pull back the curtain yeah the curtain is the infinite growth paradigm that says we're all gonna live forever thank you yeah so let's pull back the curtain the curtain recognize that life is short right recognize that we don't have long in this physical realm and act accordingly yeah and for me that acting accordingly means creating or maintaining the important relationships in my life. Mm. It's not about getting more stuff. Mm. You know, he who has the most toys still dies. Mm -hmm. The American poet Charles Bukowski said it best. We're all going to die. That alone should make us love each other, but it doesn't. Mm. He was right about that. Let's return to that notion that we're all going to die. We can study and study and study and get as much money in our bank accounts as we want. And does that matter? I I doubt if anybody, I doubt if any millionaire or billionaire when they're on their deathbed having their final living thoughts, I doubt Mm. if any of them are thinking, oh man, I should have doubled down on that stock. (laughs) I should have bought more shoes, right? When it becomes all about materialistic possessions, we lose our way. And I would argue that we lost our way a long time ago. And as individuals, we can can re-find our Mm. way. Mm. I think that's, uh, I think it was very well said, Guy. I appreciate it. Thank you, Guy. You found words that I never would have found, but that's that's great. It's been a, a fabulous day. This is Earth Day. 2019, and uh, every day's an Earth Day, and uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. And man. happy trails to you. Thank you. Best to everybody. All right. Bravo! The fans go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> they were already crazy. <laughs> the camera okay. is melting down. Good yeah. job. Oh, you might want to check.
Did you say through this glass door or through the big door? No, no, through the front door there. Right. Okay, thank you. Caught by cat patients. I know, isn't that crazy? Sign there. And that's just, to give just people so far a, in 2019. I know, just gives mm -hmm. people an, adopt, an idea. Caught by cat. It's re released. I visited when there was still a bear on your premises. That was in, he died in 1989, anywhere right there. Yeah, it's oh, a beautiful cool. old building too. It's Look at this building. building Look yeah. at this architecture. This was the community hall mm. for the St. Paul's Episcopal Church in San Rafael. Oh, wow. And in 1954, mm. the Optimists Club mm -hmm. took that building, broke it into pieces, trucked mm. it over here on trucks, oh, wow. and built it here to be a natural history museum. Oh, it's so perfect. It's really cool, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's all, I'm sure it's all redwood. It's, uh, we're a little worried. I mean, we're looking for a new facility because this place is falling down around oh. our ears and is much too small. But mm. um, it's. Now uh, you're. Wasn't there a plan to move up to Ignacio? Did that fall through? Yeah, that fell through. Fortunately, oh. Oh, okay. I'm actually really glad. I think it would have been. Uh -huh. um, I think it would have been too big for us ultimately. Uh -huh. But basically, what happened is when we first bid out that project, it was yeah. around twelve million dollars, which oh, wow. we were able to raise. By wow. the time it got to the point of actually raising, you know, finishing, starting the project, over twenty million. And there's no way an organization of our size can do that. So we were wow. able to negotiate our way out, and that worked out well. Congrats. <laughs> What's the story on this bear? Uh, he's an interesting thing. He has actually been around, we think, probably since the 30s. He wow. was at the Randall Museum in San Francisco for many years. Wow. And he is an Alaskan brown bear, which is a oh. subspecies of the grizzly. Oh, I was wondering if he was but a California grizzly. for many, grizzly. many years, he was kept in a foyer that was, uh, it was a glassed-in foyer. So there was a bunch of sun that came in. Mm. So he had a lot of sun bleaching, and we call him. We say he's a Californian. He's a bleached blonde bear. Oh, he is so he kind would of normally a, be a much darker color. He is kind of a golden bear. Yes, and the other interesting thing about him, you see the bandages on his paws. Yeah, what was that about? So when you taxidermy an animal, right? Obviously, anything that's soft gets replaced with plastic, like his nose, his tongue, his eyes. Those are all plastic. The eyes uh -huh. are glass. Uh -huh. So originally, he had plastic claws because bears, of course, have big claws. So these uh -huh. were plastic claws. We had people coming in here and stealing those claws oh. and apparently taking them out and trying to sell them as real artifacts. Oh, and that happened often enough and they were expensive enough to replace that yeah. we eventually just decided that he would look like he was in care. Oh, he has okay. bandages on too. Yeah, we calculate that 90, 95% of the patients that come into the wildlife hospital come in because of an inter a negative interaction with humans. And so, you know, it's one of the main reasons we do what we do is that we're, we're trying to make up for those ills, make up for those accidents and injuries. The mm. taxidermy we have in here um, is a little grubby looking and yeah. I actually old. really love that. Mm -hmm. Well, some of them are older, but the thing I like the most about them is that we actually let the kids touch oh, okay. and experience the taxidermy with their hands. So, nice. And that's just a really unique opportunity. Wow. It's, you're never going to get the chance to pet a bobcat, so yeah. this is a, a yeah. really rare and unique opportunity. Yeah. But they do tend to go for like the ears and stuff, so those get a little scratched yeah. up. Oh, tell but, me about uh, this uh, the stuffed mountain lion. Looks kind of yes. a, a dog. Yeah, and that's always something I think that surprises people when they when they see him. Just how much bigger an adult cat would be, probably a quarter again that size. Yeah. But we frequently, and I love this display here. We frequently have people that are convinced beyond belief that they have seen a mountain lion in their yard, mm. and we're like, okay, we're going to show you a bob cat yeah. and we're going to show you a mountain lion yeah. and you tell me if what you saw was a bobcat and 99 percent of the time they come in here and they're like uh oh, yeah he was stripy he was only about this big and he didn't have a tail yep that was wow. a bobcat <laughs> wow yeah things always get bigger in your mind exactly right? like people do want to like uh, exactly yeah my he owl is in his in, in, uh, in his hole up there, oh, so look at he him. might be kind of hard to get. I was hoping that uh, actually Sequoia is a girl. I've been he, we thought Sequoia was a male for many many years, so I still say he. But uh, so these are mm -hmm. all animals that were former wildlife hospital patients, mm -hmm. and they have shown that they're not able to survive in the wild, and they've mm -hmm. also shown that they can deal with the rigors of captivity. Mm -hmm. And so we have them here as educational animals, and we have a small number of permits to keep animals like these for educational permit purposes. We call them our wildlife ambassadors, and that's what they really are, as ambassadors for their species. So and you have to have a permit for uh, to- Very much to so. Oh, really? Yep, 
Absolutely. It is uh, one of Wild Care's primary advocacy messages is we really, really don't want people to ever take wild animals as pets oh. because wild animals make terrible pets. There are so many domestic animals out there in shelters that desperately need homes. Wild animals should be left in the wild because they do eventually turn into the wild animals that they actually are, which makes them not at all compatible with people. So Sequoia fell out of her nest when she was a baby. She was actually in the Mere Woods area and she fell out of her nest mm -hmm. and she landed on the ground, came in, and it turns out she had damaged her patagic tendon on the way down, which is the tendon that goes from the shoulder to the wrist of a bird. Mm -hmm. And she had damaged that to a point that she was able to fly, but mm -hmm. she was not able to fly silently. Oh, wow. And she is a northern spotted owl, which lives in the deepest, darkest, quietest redwood forests. So if we were to release her, and if I can hear her coming, I guarantee you the mice and rats can hear her coming, wow. she would not have been able to feed herself and would not have been able to survive. So that's why she's here as an educational animal. Fingers when you only have one layer of wire, so hence the double layers. But Vladimir is one of our, our case studies. He has been at Wild Care for more than 30 years. Oh my goodness. So he is an elderly guy. You can't really tell looking at him. Yeah. Uh, he was found by somebody that thought a turkey vulture would make a good pet. Oh my lord. As we all know, turkey vultures make terrible pets for several different reasons. First of all, when they get stressed, they projectile vomit. <laughs> <laughs> and the other really fun thing that turkey vultures do is when they are finished eating, they defecate on their own feet. I've heard of that. Uh-huh, and that allows a way for them to clean their feet and keep, them, keep themselves bacteria-free. But neither of these things are terribly conducive to pet maintenance, right? So whoever had him, oh yes, very nice way to illustrate that, Vlad, thank you. Whoever had him thought that he would make a good pet, found him when he was a fluffy baby and brought him in, kept him for, you know, probably six months, and then was like, well, I can't keep him as a pet, and brought him to, uh, the, to Wild Care at what was then the California Center for Wildlife, and he has been here ever since. And he's, you know, he doesn't know he's a turkey vulture. We have tried to wild him several times by getting him, you know, in touch with other vultures. He wants nothing to do with them. He's not interested in them. They're very social birds, so you do need to have that social bond, and he is much more interested in people than he is in other vultures. So unfortunately, he is here because somebody thought he'd make a good pet. Not good. What? You're very handsome. You've done a good job. He has. You've he seen a lot. Teaches You're lots of kids. Stories to tell. That's it. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah, he's uh, you, he's you, a favorite. It's 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 amazing that. Well, I mean, I, I at some level, for a caged animal, you feel sorry, but Definitely. the. the you know, maybe these animals have just sort of found their spot in life and their free food and... It's an interesting thing, you know, like the opossums, I don't worry about the opossums at all. Mm -hmm. In every way an opossum, you, they're like, woohoo, I landed on my feet. I do worry about the birds mm -hmm. and we give them the highest quality life we possibly can in captivity and they get lots of enrichment, they get lots of stimulation, they get lots of you know, experiences to keep their minds happy and keep their bodies happy, but it's still a sad thing to keep an animal in a cage. Um, the educational benefit mm. outweighs, you know, in, in most, you know, in, in circumstances like, like this, and certainly Vladimir is not obviously stressed by humans, so he's not feeling any, any you know, distress about having us here. Um, we would never keep an animal in captivity that is in, in pain in any way or suffering mm. in any way. Um, they all need to demonstrate that they can handle the, the stresses of being in captivity. And they all need to show that they wouldn't be able to survive in the wild otherwise. Ooh, what's that? Did you see that crow? That was cool, huh? Was that a crow oh, outside crow the cage? Crow just flew over, yeah. Oh. yeah. But, uh, you know, very, very specific testing that we do before we determine that an animal would make an educational animal. And, uh, yeah, we're, we're very aware of the... Of the yeah. Pros what's the what's the, what's the what's the permit process like? Who do you go? Is this a state agency that it is for on? birds? It's even more onerous. Yeah. But uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife yeah. is who provides our permits, and mm -hmm. then because birds are protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, mm -hmm. they all, we also have to get federal permits to mm -hmm. keep these guys. So, mm -hmm. which is a very very good thing. You want it to be mm -hmm. a difficult and challenging process to get mm -hmm. permits mm -hmm. to have birds in captivity, just because it it shouldn't right. be something that most people do, exactly. and you do need to pay attention to their very specific dietary needs and their exercise needs and their, you know, stress and anxiety needs and so. Certainly with the uh, prol proliferation of uh, YouTube animal videos, people more and more are seeing the sort of the depth of intelligence of animals and uh, it's no pretty question. interesting. Pretty no interesting. question. 
intelligence, personality, decision making, all of those things. None of those things are unique to humans, and, mm. and it's 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 complete. It's both incredibly rude of us to think that we would be the only ones that would have those those mm. higher mm -hmm. functioning capacities, mm -hmm. and and also just naive of us because that's not true. Right. He, he came in here as a patient, and then proceeded to be kept as an educational animal again because he, he was not demonstrating the skills that he needed to survive in the wild. What is he? Uh, he's a peregrine. He is an American kestrel. American kestrel. Mm -hmm. Is that in the peregrine family he then? He is a falcon, so uh -huh. falcon, uh, uh, kestrels and peregrines are both falcons. Uh -huh. Other than that, I think that's the extent of the uh -huh. relation. But uh, yes, obviously both raptors, both falcons. So they have a, a very similar look, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, we do have a peregrine here as well. Uh -huh. yeah. So he's not the one, the peregrine are the ones that fly extraordinarily fast Correct. when they dive. Correct, uh, yes. The peregrine is apparently is the fastest animal in the world. It's a, a stooping dive at, uh, what, 200 miles an hour or something like that, oh, catching boy. birds on the wing. And I love that peregrines are thriving in urban areas because they are so good at catching pigeons. Drop down out of the sky, catch themselves a juicy fat pigeon and have themselves a meal. So you're seeing a real resurgence of peregrine populations in those urban, so, you know, urban canyons. Right. You know, they used to nest on high rocky cliffs yeah. and take whatever birds were flying through and we, yeah. we've perfectly replicated that with our downtown buildings. Oh, wow, so that's very interesting. Really well. Yeah, if you do oh, it, everybody's and you just, excited. So what's going on with the pelican? Is he yeah. just playing, really? Yep, so these are also ambassadors. So these are uh, non-releasable animals. Uh, we have the brown pelican, the Hearman's gull, the cormorant, whoever she is. And then our newest ambassador is our white pelican here, American white pelican, named Marshall. And Marshall was actually hit by a car. They actually squeezed him out from underneath the car that hit him. And he um, is, is Marshall here sitting on the... Marshall is the white one here. Oh, oh. Yep, that's Baja, the brown pelican, mm. and he uh, he had obviously gotten some head trauma, some permanent head trauma that rendered him non-releasable. He's also blind in one eye and has some, some issues going on with his foot, too. Oh, so. poor guy. Yeah, but he's obviously very amenable to playing with humans, so that has made him a unique... He's a little guy. He's, a, he's still playing. He's still playing. Yeah, he's right. still young, isn't he? He's still a little, a little, a little playful guy. Yep. Obviously, this would not be something we would ever do with our wildlife patients. Wild Care cares for as many as 4,000 injured Whoa. and orphaned animals Whoa. every year in the wildlife hospital. Those guys are all treated with a minimum of interaction with humans. Obviously, we mm. are not doing our job if the animals that leave our wildlife hospital come out yeah, they want with a stay sense with that you. humans are friends, yeah. right? So Whoa. we do not interact with our wildlife patients like this but certainly our non-releasable educational animals are, are, are looking for that interaction. Mm, they need... And he's a... Yeah. He, he, he's an enrichment. <laughs> he's, he is like any he'll, other child. He'll they play just throw toss. him on the floor and wait for you to pick, him up, for you to pick him up again. And we just do exactly. this over and over and over. Oh, is that right? so funny. What an amazing guy. We he, just he got He wants him. you to play? He wants you to throw the... He was well, he's just interested in Character. Things. Oh, he tossed it to back to you. And does he play catch? Not yet. We're learning. Yeah, we're learning. Is, we're getting wow. there. This is. We have a bunch of different kinds of toys, and we're trying to see what interests him. It gives him a little mental stimulation. Yeah. Because he's just a young guy, and he needs things to do. <laughs> Apparently, well, making you I pick things too. up. <laughs> yes, exactly. Apparently I have thing, I need things to do as well. Yep. Oh, he's so wonderful. He's mm. such a cool guy. Crazy. Yeah. Just amazing. Oh my. So again, non-releasable, he would not be able to survive in the wild. He has uh, some vision deficits, he has some mental deficits, and he has a, a you know, can't fly or walk as well as he would be. Mm. And they bring us, go ahead. Yeah. And they bring us 20%, so people call them to bring us animals. Wow. But, uh, yeah, so 4,000 animals coming through, and again, that, those 200 different species, such a huge disparity between, let's see. Right. So you have, you know, for instance, that would be the anesthesia mask for a coyote or for a bobcat or something oh, like that. Oh, wow. And then you have something like that that would be the anesthesia mask for, like, a squirrel. Or then if somebody's even smaller, you put them in a box like this. So oh my God. everything that our medical staff and our veterinary team does in here has to be, you know, scalable to somebody this big and somebody this big. So it really is a, it's a astonishing amount of knowledge to accumulate. Um, the 
medical team that we have, most of them have been doing wildlife medicine for 20 plus years. So we have very, very experienced staff. Our, our veterinarian volunteered at Wild Care when she first started, when she first became interested in, wild, in medicine, and she ended up going from here to get her veterinary degree, worked as a small animal vet for several years, and then came back here as our veterinarian. So that's very exciting. Do you, so you have one veterinarian who one is veterinarian. on staff? Yep. Uh, and interestingly, you don't need to be a veterinarian to work with wildlife. There are not a lot of restrictions on that. Melanie, who runs the Wildlife Hospital, our director of animal care, she has uh, been doing wildlife rehab since, gosh, for more than 20 years at this point, 20, 25 years at this point. And it's just an accumulation of knowledge that is pretty astonishing. Review with me your volunteers again. Are they, uh, about how many, and is it an easy process to become a volunteer? Challenging process to become a volunteer. Challenging. We actually just had our new volunteer orientations that we hold once a year mm -hmm. in late February. Mm -hmm. So if you want to become a volunteer in the Wildlife Hospital at Wild Care, you mm -hmm. would need to come to an orientation, which mm -hmm. again are scheduled only once a year. Mm -hmm. You then sign up for a series of classes. So it's 11 hours of training that you get over the course of several classes. Uh, then you do several shadowing days, mm -hmm. and then you officially sh start your volunteer shift. Okay. And we request from our volunteers that they do a regular four-hour shift once a week mm -hmm. from essentially March through November. And so same vo volunteer shift every week, coming in for four hours. You're feeding, you're cleaning, you're helping medicate, you're setting up cages, you're scooping a lot of poop. There's a lot of mm -hmm. that kind of stuff that goes mm -hmm. on. But we have a wonderful group of volunteers. During mm -hmm. the busy season, we have about 500 active volunteers. During mm -hmm. the slower seasons right now, we're just going into baby season now. Mm -hmm. And we will have um, you you know, a couple the, hundred uh, volunteers sure. that are active during this time of year. And uh, yeah, very, very dedicated. Very incredibly. impressive, amazing. Absolutely, and yeah. there is absolutely no way that we could care for 4,000 animals every year without our amazing volunteers. They are just incredible people. Are other counties and places in California as lucky as uh, we are here in Santa Fe to have you guys? Depends on the place, depends yeah. on the place. Um, mm. We're lucky in California that there are wildlife hospitals. I grew up in Utah and there's mm. one for the entire state. Mm. And um, so having, there's, there's one in Sonoma, there's Lindsay Wildlife, which is also a larger center that's over in.